It's around 1am in the morning of the 28th of December 2010. A passenger train travelling at speed from Manchester to Leeds carrying 45 passengers and two crew is around halfway through the 1.6 mile long sonic tunnel deep beneath the Pennon range. When suddenly there is a loud bang and the train is jolted and starts to shudder. The frightened occupants fear that in moments this may be the end of the line for this journey. What happens inside the tunnel on this Christmas holiday period will stun the rail community to its core. And this is one of the most unbelievable accidents I have read through whilst researching these investigations. This is the true and shocking story of the Class 185 Pennine Summit Tunnel Derailment. The Pennines are a mountain range in the UK, often said to be the backbone of Britain. They form an unbroken range stretching from the Peak District in the Midlands, through the Yorkshire Dales and Cumbrian Fells, all the way to the hills on the Scottish border, stretching to a length of around 250 miles, 402 kilometres. The landscape of the Pennines are mostly areas of high moorland. The Pennines make up the main watershed in northern England by dividing the eastern and western parts of the country. The rivers Eden, Ribble, the Mersey flow west towards the Irish Sea. On the other side of the watershed, the rivers Tyne, Tees, Swale, Calder, Ayr, Don and Trent flow to the east, to the North Sea. A beautiful scene of unspoilt moorland, any of the trails and bridleways are a hiker's paradise or a well-deserved rest from a cross-country mountain bike ride. The railway through the landscape is the legendary Trans Pennine Express. It consists of a double track main line which has a permitted speed of 70 miles per hour or 113 kilometers per hour, reducing into the tunnel in question to 65 miles an hour, 105 kilometers per hour, 16 miles or 40 chains. If you're wondering what the word chain is doing here, it's railway terminology for a unit of measurement, equaling 66 feet or 22 yards, equal to around 20.1 metres and still used on rail infrastructure to indicate their locations even today. The summit tunnel or the scene of this accident has a fascinating backstory and a slightly troubled one at that. The tunnel was constructed between 1838 and 1841 by the Manchester and Leeds Railway, well over budget and behind schedule, although the issues didn't stop there. It's located deep beneath the Pennines between Littleborough and Wollstone stations on the line that runs between Manchester and Leeds via Hebden Bridge. The tunnel is around 1.6 miles long or 2.6 kilometres and was the longest tunnel in the world when it opened back in 1841. The tunnel was aligned and built by digging 14 construction shafts which were to be used as ventilation shafts once the tunnel was in operation. Be reminded that the age of steam was very much alive at this time. The tallest of these shafts was 120 metres from the tunnel ceiling and they had a diameter of around 5 metres. Three of these shafts were closed up just after construction and a further two shafts were closed during repairs after a major fire in 1984, leaving nine open shafts. It's a horseshoe shaped design and it's primarily lined with six courses of brick using 23 million bricks in total although some areas are now lined with concrete after being repaired over the years. During its construction it's told that 41 construction workers died in the process so no stranger to tragedy and it would appear the summit tunnel was already prepared to take lives even before its opening on the 1st of March. The train involved and the one that we're talking about today is the British Rail Class 185. It's a class of diesel hydraulic multiple units or DHMUs. These passenger trains are built by Siemens Transportation Systems. Obligation under the franchise agreement was to introduce a new fleet of diesel multiple units capable of operating at speeds of up to 100 miles per hour or 160 kilometers per hour. Also specified was the need for air conditioning, two toilets per vehicle with one suitable for reduced mobility passengers and first class seating and passenger compartment CCTV. They also seen a rectified 230 volt 50 hertz single phase supply and 110 volt DC auxiliary supply. Additionally the train's acceleration was to be an improvement on the class 158 and comparable to the class 180. 
Each vehicle carries its own powertrain, driving both axles on one of the vehicle's bogies via carding shafts. Each powertrain consists of a 752 horsepower turbo diesel engine. The other bogey on each vehicle is unpowered. A very technical, comfortable and well equipped unit for its time launched in the mid 2000s. The UK weather during the winter time is unpredictable year by year and this Christmas in 2010 saw a period of sustained cold weather that started towards the end of November, bringing heavy snowfalls and falling temperatures that regularly plunged well below freezing. This would become part of an unexpected and unwanted Christmas gift as the country was hit by an arctic blast from the north, then shifting winds saw the UK to be battered again from Siberia for a second time from the east. Support to infrastructure suffered, failed electricity supplies and transport had been greatly disrupted and frozen pipes left over 40,000 people without water, a winter storm that had already taken 20 lives. The driver of the train, the 1P02, was based at First Trans Pennine Express train crew depot at York. He had 20 years experience driving and was very familiar with the route and this type of train. The second crew member, the conductor, had been working in his role for eight years and also very experienced. The 1P02 is the 12.38am service to Manchester Airport to York. The train consisted of a three car diesel multiple unit and the train was in good rail going condition with no apparent problems or issues. It departs on time and this journey will be taken around one hour and 45 minutes and see the passenger and two crews settling in for between seven and nine stops along the way. This route, as well as many other parts of the UK, still blanketed by snow in certain places. A twilight trip into the Pennines would have been a joy to see through the windows of the carriages, a picture postcard in most cases, as snow remained on the rooftops and across fields and roads for weeks. The moon in its last quarter, 50% visible, with only the light cloud passing through the sky, briefly illuminating the snow, giving a visual depth and enabling the trees and the buildings to be easier to be made out in rural areas and the hillsides bright white against the black skyline. The journey so far has been uneventful. The train arrives and departs to and from stations en route. The platforms in most places free from snow although left wet from salt and grit. Passengers leave and join from stop to stop. The floor of the carriages are dampened by the footfall. This in turn creates a little condensation on the windows as the blowers on the heating system fight against the sub-zero temperatures to keep the occupants comfortable, although their comfort will soon be compromised in a way that nobody could forecast. It's around 1.23 in the morning, the passenger train travelling past Littleborough towards Walsden Station with 45 passengers and two crew on board is now inside the 1.6 mile long summit tunnel deep beneath the Pennines, travelling around 60 miles per hour. The train is more than halfway through when suddenly there is a loud bang and the first carriage is jolted upwards, followed by another as it comes crashing down. Then it starts to shake and shudder, followed by a grinding and scraping noise. Passengers cling to anything not to be thrown from their seats. The frightened occupants are fully aware that the UK is still on high alert. The country is still reeling from a recent widespread spree of terror attacks between London and Glasgow using explosives and have been targeting airports, trains and buses. The occupants have no clue that in moments this will be the end of the line for this journey. The lights flashing on and off as the power is interrupted, plunging the carriages into complete darkness, further enhancing the fears with every jolt, judder, screech and scream. The driver has applied full emergency brake trying to slow the speeding coaches but it's too late. The train has hit a 20 ton, 1.6 metre tall pile of ice that's fallen from the 100 metre tall ventilation shaft that now lies across both lines, leaving an impassable debris field over 8 metres across, reaching out to both sides of the tunnel walls. The ice is so compact, it immediately launches the first bogey airborne for a distance of 9 metres into the tunnel wall. Smashing down the bogies across the sleepers, the ballast bombarding the underside of the coaches, the engines and the running gear with incredible intensity. The train now pushed up against the tunnel wall, the nearly 200 year old bricks start ripping at the train, grinding their way through the metal to the terrified occupants inside. 
Emergency alarms blare from the desk in the driver's cab as the passengers scream from the coaches behind in pure panic. The train travels a further 254 metres before coming to a stop. In the cold, in the tunnel, in total radio silence. This accident story is really one of two halves, as the rescue efforts are as harrowing as the accident itself. As when the train came to a stop, it's now under another one of the ventilation shafts, this one 80 metres to the opening to the frozen Pennine hilltops. It became hindered by more falling ice once it had crashed, the residual heat from the train which was just enough to upset the balance between frozen and falling which halted the rescue efforts for a full three hours making sure rescuers and passengers was not injured or killed after the initial crash and as a result all the occupants walked away this time. The two crew became instant heroes as their actions were faultless, keeping the passengers on the train, the driver risking his own life to go to help as for no reception on any communication devices to raise the alarm and the conductor clipping the rails to turn all the approach signals to red putting himself at risk to save others, then staying in control with the frightened passengers until the rescue. Reading from the report, the RIAB advised the plan to be devised, aimed to provide infrastructure maintenance staff who go out on the railway each day, with guidance relating to buildings and civil engineering assets such as earthworks, drainage and structures. This included advice on what to look for during extreme weather, and explain the purpose of the list of the structures at risk. Ice in tunnels was identified as a specific risk and the guidance gave general advice on what infrastructure maintenance staff should do. I have lots more of these off the rails episodes lined up for you, so if you like this kind of content and would like to see more, it's free to subscribe and set the little notification bell to all and YouTube will send you a notification when the next ones are uploaded. I hope to see you further down the line. So until then, keep it on the rails.